few days of opportunity. We've made some progress in the completion of this, then we'll go through and finish it. I want now to read a statement again from the Great Controversy, page 343. And this statement finds very strong support and vindication in the parallel which we're building on the board today. Great Controversy, page 343. The chapter is called Light Through Darkness, and it's the first paragraph in the chapter. The work of God in the earth presents from age to age a striking similarity in every great reformational religious movement. The principles of God's dealing with men are ever the same. The important movements of the present have their parallel in those of the past, and the experience of the church in former ages has lessons of great value for our own time. And the, it says here, the important movements of the present have their parallel in those of the past. And as this picture builds on the board today, we'll certainly recognize the truth of those words, which say again, the important movements of the present have their parallel in those of the past. I want now to fill in the details in regard to what took place before Daniel's captivity and before the great period of the Dark Ages, and the details of what took place in the interval between 538 and 457 BC, and the corresponding events between 1798 and 1844. I should mention, of course, that in parallels, the time span is not the parallel. Here, for instance, there are 70 years in this captivity, 1,260 in this one. Here we have uh, something like about um, 70, 81 years there, and uh, something like 50-odd years there. So the time span differs, but the actual events in those time spans is what the parallel is all about. Now it's a principle that um, the great day of God cannot come, or at least the great apostasy cannot arise, until there comes a falling away first. Let's turn to Thessalonians, where Paul makes this point, and makes it very clearly and strongly. Hmm. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And here Paul is talking about the rise of the man of sin. Start with verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. That day shall not come, verse 3 says, unless there comes a falling away first, and the, son of, and the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition. Now, a study of history demonstrates that uh, every uprising of the man of sin, be it um, Babylon or Egypt, as the case may be, is always preceded by a falling away amongst God's true people. Now, for instance, we recognize that from the days of Solomon down to um, the days of Daniel, there was a very serious falling away in, in the true church of God. Now, in the days of David and Solomon, Israel was the most effective military power in the world. We recognize, of course, that Israel should never have maintained her might by military preeminence, that God would have protected them by better means than that if they had laid aside the sword. But once they took that sword, they, de they then became a military power in the world. And if they had not fallen away subsequent to Solomon's death, or David's death and Solomon's apostasy, and the great division which took place between Israel and Judah, then what hope would, would Babylon have had of ruling the entire world? And the answer is none. In fact, when you read the book of Jeremiah, you learn that even at the very last moment of time, as it were, when um, the Babylonians were already marching against the Israelites, at the very last moment of time, if they had repented, uh, God would still have delivered them from the Babylonians and Babylon would not have ruled the world because Israel would, would remain free. And therefore, the falling away of God's people always precedes the rising up of the man of sin. That was true in Paul's time, when the church fell away, of course, the Dark Ages came into being, and Babylon once again ruled the world. 
And if we think of our own time, we recognise that there has been a dreadful spiritual falling away both in the Protestant churches and in the Adventist church over the past hundred years or so. And as the apostasy deepens, what do we find rising up into greatness of power? Babylon the Great. Before very long, of course, Babylon is going to rule the world once more. Now, in the book Great Controversy, Sister White makes this point and makes it quite strongly and clearly. Let's read the statement in the chapter entitled uh, The Immutability of God's Law, or God's Law Immutable. Find here quickly if I can. Right. And uh, it starts on page 443. It was apostasy that led the early church to seek the aid of the, of the civil government and this prepared the way for the development of the papacy of the beast. <coughs> Said Paul, there shall come a falling away and that man of sin be revealed. Second Thessalonians 2 verse 3. So apostasy in the church will prepare the way for the image of the beast. Note those words. So apostasy in the church will prepare the way for the image of the beast. So the principle is quite plainly established in the word of God and established through history that only when, first of all, the church of God goes into apostasy does the man of sin have the chance to rise up and rule the entire world. We've already noted the falling away from Solomon's day to the captivity. Now, was there not a parallel falling away from the days of the apostles down to the rise of papal power in the Dark Ages? In both situations, we have the same developments. We really noted that during the period of captivity, both between 606 and 538 BC and 538 and 798 AD, the sanctuary was cast down in both cases, the daily was taken away in both cases, and the man of sin, well, I mean the people of God were in bondage of captivity during both of those periods of time. Now Sister White herself recognises the, um, what's the word, the parallel between these two periods of time. I'll just find the statement again now, I think it was 714. Yep, yeah. page 714 in the book Prophets and Kings. And uh, in making a comparison between the two periods of time, Sister White talks about the darkness of the Dark Ages in these words. Well, first of all, today, the Church of God is free to carry forward the, to completion the divine plan, the salvation of a lost race. For many centuries, God's people suffered a restriction of their liberties. The preaching of the gospel in its purity was prohibited and the severest penalties were visited upon those who dared disobey the mandates of men. As a consequence, the Lord's great moral vineyard was almost wholly unoccupied. The people were deprived of the light of God's word, the darkness of error and superstition threatened to blot out a knowledge of true religion. Now comes the important little sentence or two. God's church on earth was as verily in captivity during this long period of relentless persecution as were the children of Israel held captive in Babylon during the period of the exile. So Sister White draws a parallel between the church during this long period of darkness and the church back in the days of Babylon. I'll read the sentence again. God's church on earth was as verily or as truly in captivity during this long period of relentless persecution, that's between 5 and 1798 AD, as were the children of Israel held captive in Babylon during the period of the exile. So there is a very definite parallel being drawn by Sister White between those two periods of time. Now, <clears throat> we know of course that in 538 BC Babylon fell. What took place in 1798? The fall of... Right, the Pope was captured, taken away by General Berthier. And um, the power of Rome was broken and Babylon fell and fell heavily in 1798, so badly of course we read that in Revelation 13 that a deadly wound was administered, a mortal wound it seemed, and there was great confidence amongst the uh, religious people of, the, of that time that the papacy had come to its end forever. Only those who read the prophecy of Revelation recognized of course there was a mortal wound which would be healed and the papacy would again rule the world as she is faithful to do in the very near future. The very near future indeed. Now, <clears throat> Back in the days when uh, Babylon fell back there and Ezra and Nehemiah arose in their turn, what was the call that went forth by those men at God's command? Come out of her, my people. And there was a message between 538 and 457 BC, Come out of her, my people. 
and a remnant, only a remnant, responded. You know, of the of the of this large number who who were taken captive to Babylon, the majority had settled down to live in the land of their exile. They had learned the language. Most of them had been actually born there because uh, 70 years had passed during the captivity and therefore the present generation had been born in Babylon. It's the only land they knew. It's the land of their wealth and prosperity so the, most of them decided to stay right where they were. But about 50,000 came <coughs> out of Babylon to return to the land of Palestine again. And that's plainly written in, on, in Proverbs and Kings page 598. Page 598. And I'll read the statement here which verifies that particular point. <clears throat> Page 590 is correct. Chapter 49, Proverbs and Kings. Under the favour shown them by Cyrus, nearly 50,000 of the children of, Israel, of the captivity had taken advantage of the decree for being their return. These, however, were in comparison with the hundreds of thousands scattered throughout the provinces of Medo Persia were but a little remnant, a mere remnant. The great majority of the Israelites had chosen to remain in the land of their exile rather than undergo the hardships of the return journey and the re-establishment of their desolated cities and homes. Now if you took the trouble to go back to the book of Ezra and count up the people, the priests, the Nethanims and the various companies who went back to Israel at this time, you'll find they did number very, very close to 50,000. As Sister Wise says, um, nearly 50,000 went back. So let's put the number 50,000 here to indicate the number of people who returned to Jerusalem for the express purpose of rebuilding the temple and the city and to re-establishing the worship of the true God in the sacrificial system. Now, interestingly enough, the same number of people responded in the period between 1798 and 1844. And that's confirmed by reading Great Controversy, page 376, where Sister White makes this particular point. 376. Um, I'll just read a little bit of context, I think, from the top of the page down the entire paragraph. As his work tended to build up the churches, it was for a time regarded with favour, and that, of course, is the work of William Miller. But as ministers and religious leaders decided against the Advent doctrine and, des and, and desired to suppress all agitation on the subject, they, were they, not, only, they not only opposed it from the pul pulpit, but denied their members the privilege of attending meetings, preaching upon the Second Advent, or even of speaking of their hope in the social meetings in the church. Thus the believers found themselves in a position of great trial and perplexity. They loved their churches and were loath to separate from them, but as they saw the testimony of God's word suppressed and their right to investigate the prophecies denied, they felt that loyalty to God forbade them to submit. Those who sought to shut out the testimony of God's word, they could not regard as constituting the church of Christ, the pillar and ground of the truth. Hence, they felt themselves justified in separating from their former, from, a, from a connection. Now here comes the important sentence. In the summer of 1844, about 50,000 withdrew from the churches. So there we have plain statements declaring that 50,000 came out in Nehemiah's day and 50,000 came out as we move down toward the end of the 2,300 day period. Now I must stress right here that uh, we can't attach too much significance to this fact because if there had been 50,000 back in Nehemiah's day and only 5,000 or 4,000 or 3,000 days of the Advent it wouldn't break down, it wouldn't break up the parallel in the slightest degree because parallels do not depend upon exact numbers but they do, they do depend upon the same kind of developments or principles being worked out in the corresponding period. Now, God called the Israelites back from Medo-Persia and Babylon to rebuild the sanctuary and the city. That was their task. The sanctuary, of course, is the church of God and the city is the organisation of God's movements. Back in those days, of course, the city was the state and then the state and church were combined in the one nation and were ruled by the, one, uh, by the same leaders. And in 1844, to what were the people of God called? They were called back to rebuild the sanctuary truth and the church of God and to carry the work through to its finality. 
Now, in the book Revelation chapter 10, we have the statement which declares this particular work in very plain terms. Revelation 10, um, and there it talks about the mystery of God being finished in the days of the voice of the seventh angel. Verse 7, Revelation 10 verse 7, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. So then, uh, what is the mystery of God? It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And when the mystery of God is fully formed in the believer, what becomes of sin? It is ended. And uh, iniquity is brought to its finish, and everlasting righteousness is brought in. So, the, the seventh angel began to sound back in 1844. And here is the promise that in that time and he should begin to sound the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his service the prophets. So when God said those words in, eight, in regard to 1844 he was saying the same thing there has been said back in 457 BC only in different words but, but different words mean the same thing because to say sin must be ended and transgression finished the everlasting righteousness brought in is to say to finish the mystery of God. It's the same thing precisely. And to the Adventist Church in 1844 was given the same commission precisely as was given to the Jewish Church back in 457 BC. And we will find that the subsequent history of both has been fulfilled to the very letter. In Testimonies Volume 5, I've just forgotten the page, but Sister White there says that we are repeating the history of that people. We are repeating the history of that people. Now then, let's go back to 457 BC and begin to trace through the developments of what took place then. And uh, first of all, we find that they made a good beginning. Let's put these words down. They begun well. With great uh, zeal, earnestness and self-sacrifice, they built the temple and the city. There were some lapses, of course, but they finally got the job done. And the leaders like Nehemiah and Zerubbabel and Ezra tremendous progress was made and we must recognize too that subsequent to 1844 for the first few years a good beginning was made coming out of their great disappointment the early Adventist pioneers met together for hours at a time pleading with God to throw light upon difficult areas of scripture to enable them to throw off their old preconceived ideas and beliefs and to enter into the truth for that time and then Sister would be taken off in vision at the, at the critical moment and, would, and confirmation would be given that they were walking in the light and walking in the truth. So likewise we find that back here there was a good beginning subsequent to 1844. But what followed the good beginning back in the days of uh, the restoration in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah what followed the good beginning? The seemingly inevitable apostasy. I say seemingly inevitable because so far it has been the unchanging follow-on from a good beginning in the work of God, which of course is a great shame and a great pity. And subsequent to the Adventist good beginning, what we find took place? The same thing, apostasy. We read about it earlier this week, yesterday, for instance, from volume one, where the Lord through Sister White plainly told the Adventist people that they had become Laodicean without the gold, the white rabbit and the eye salve, and therefore without the gospel of Jesus Christ, without the third angel's message, and therefore in a very serious predicament. Now, let's go back to the days of um, Christ, because the same problem, and I'll now demonstrate that the same problem or situation developed back there, as in time developed also in our age and generation. I want to demonstrate that in, in very clear terms today. And once again we'll use some of the beautiful symbolism that the Word of God offers to us. I'll turn to Great Controversy, page 24, and we'll read a statement in regard to um, the temple and its overthrow. I start on page 24, read across to page 25. And this, these words in symbolic language picture the condition of the church in in simple terms back in the days of Jesus Christ it says the disciples had been filled with awe and wonder at, <clears throat> at Christ's prediction of the overthrow of the temple 
and they desired to understand more fully the meaning of his words. Wealth, labour and architectural skill had for more than 40 years been freely expended to enhance his splendours. Herod the Great had lavished upon it both Roman wealth and Jewish treasure, and even the emperor of the world had enriched it with his gifts. Massive blocks of white marble of almost fabulous size forwarded from Rome for this purpose formed a part of its structure, and to these the disciples had called the attention of their master, saying, See what manner of stones or buildings are here, Mark 13 verse 1. To these words Jesus made the solemn and startling reply, Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another which shall not be thrown down, Matthew 24 and verse 2. Now let's go back now and ask ourselves, why did the apostles conclude that the temple was virtually indestructible? Well, first of all, of course, it was an extremely solid structure. Secondly, it was an extremely beautiful structure. But the two major reasons why they did not anticipate the destruction of this building are these. In the first case, it formed the absolute centre of the Jewish economy, the Jewish religion the Jew and Jewish pride. And uh, to, to the Jew, it was the world's only really sacred building. And so they knew that no Jew would cast it down. They were quite sure about that. And the Romans had invested an enormous amount of money and labour and skill in this building as well. It says that wealth labour and architectural skill had for more than 40 years been freely expended to enhance its splendours. There was a lavished money upon it, well the next sentence says that, Herod the Great had lavished upon it both Roman wealth and Jewish treasure, and even the emperor of the world had enriched it with his gifts. He sent massive blocks of white marble, and there's nothing to compare with Italian white marble, of almost fabulous size, forward from Rome for this purpose formed a part of its structure. So when, when the Romans had spent 40 years embellishing and beautifying this building at enormous cost, I suppose that they were running to several million, perhaps a billion dollars altogether, then, then what, what would motivate them to destroy their own handiwork, to turn around and pull, pull down what they themselves had built up? And so the disciples felt that there was no chance of this building being torn apart. But Jesus knew better, and he recognised that the very things in that building, in other words, the Jewish and Roman investment, that that was the guarantee not of its permanency, but of a certain destruction. Let's come back now and see what Jesus could see in that structure, at least something of what he could see in that mighty structure. Now when God gave Moses the directions to build the original sanctuary, God was very particular that every detail was observed according to the plan given to Moses in the mountain. And um, every item in the building was, was, was significant, was important and very, very meaningful. I want now to demonstrate that the sanctuary was a picture of what God designed a true Christian to be. We'll do this quite briefly because obviously it's a subject which could engage our attention for many hours. Now, <clears throat> there was the Old Testament structure with two apartments. And those of you who have read the little book entitled The Three Temples will recognize that um, that building <coughs> itself uh, is a perfect picture of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. The fine statement which um, con confirms that of course is, is in Desire of Ages where Sister White um, likens Christ's incarnation to the actual building. I read it now on page 24, I think it's 25. No, it's page 23 and 24. Desire of Ages 23 and 24. God commanded Moses for Israel, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, Exodus 25 verse 8, and he abode in the sanctuary in the midst of his people. Through all their weary wandering in the desert, the symbol of his presence was with them. So Christ set up his tabernacle in the midst of our human encampment. He pitched his tent by the sides of the tents of men, that he might dwell among us and make us familiar with his divine character and life. Now first of all, Sister White recalls the words, of Mo words to Moses by God 
let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell amongst them and he abode in the sanctuary in the midst of his people <coughs> so, so there's one picture of God or Jesus Christ dwelling in this building made by earthly hands of earthly sin cursed materials then it says so Christ set up his tent or tabernacle in the midst of our human encampment in other words exactly as the building was constructed back there with the presence of God in an earthly building so Jesus Christ came down to dwell as a divine being in an earthly tabernacle that is a human body the human body of course being made of the sin cursed dust of the earth being mortal and sinful but the presence in that building or that body of course was sinless and perfect so that building back there was designed by God to teach the Israelites or to give them a picture of the incarnation it was also designed to show them what they themselves were to be let's just briefly note some of the points about it the outside appearance of the building was quite plain the final covering is called seal skins it's called beta skins in the King James but it's also called seal skins in the margin and you know yourselves that when you take seal skins off a seal and dry them out that they have a very dull, lustreless, unpleasant and unattractive appearance very much so they're neat and tidy of course but they're not what you call gay and bright and beautiful likewise the outward adorning of the Christian was not to be uh, shabby and untidy and unclean is to be, is, is to be not to be accented by fashion and brilliant colours and grand styles and so forth our adorning is inward and not outward and where was the real beauty in the tabernacle? It was inward. The walls were overlaid with shining gold, the furniture was exquisitely made, and the soft glow of the candlesticks shed a very lovely light throughout the entire building. And in that building, of course, was a table of showbread symbolizing our need to feed upon the bread of life every day, the altar of incense to indicate the establishment of the prayer life, the <coughs> candlesticks to symbolize the presence and illumination of the Holy Spirit, and the innermost heart of the sanctuary of course was written the law of God by his own finger the whole building was pervaded with peace very very lovely soft gentle peace just as the life of the Christian no matter what his torments or trials may be is to be a life of sweet and perfect peace now the point I wish to make and make very strongly is this and of course we spend the rest of the day discussing the symbolism of the sanctuary but I, I just want to make the point nothing more than that now while ever the children of Israel looked to that building and regarded it as being the model of what God planned that they should be then that building remained a perfect model of what they were to be but when they turned their eyes off the tabernacle of God and looked at the world around about them and began to model their lives after the temples of Baal then the building changed the actual tabernacle changed and it changed from being a picture of what God planned they should be to being a reflection of what they had become now that principle is a very vital one and is established very plainly in the book Desire of Ages page 161 I believe it to be which describes the coming of Christ to his temple to cleanse it for the first time when he discovered the buyers and sellers therein page 161 Desire of Ages reads as follows in the cleansing of the temple Jesus was announcing his mystery as the Messiah and entering upon his work that temple erected for the abode of the divine presence was designed to be an object lesson for Israel and for the world from eternal ages it was God's purpose that every created being from the bright and holy seraph to man should be a temple for the indwelling of the creator because of sin humanity ceases to, ceased to be a temple for God darkened and defiled by evil the heart of man no longer revealed the glory of the divine one but by the incarnation of the son of God the purpose of heaven is fulfilled God dwells in humanity and through saving grace the heart of man becomes again his temple God designed that the temple of Jerusalem should be a continual witness to the high destiny open to every soul but the Jews had not understood the significance of the building they regarded with so much pride they did not yield themselves as holy temples for the uh, divine spirit the courts of the temple of Jerusalem filled with the tumult of unholy traffic represented all too truly the, the temple of the heart defiled by the presence of sensual passion and, and unholy thoughts in cleansing, in cleansing the temple from the world's buyers and sellers 
Jesus announced his mission to cleanse the heart from the defilement of sin, from the earth, earthly desires, the selfish lust, the, the evil habits that corrupt the soul. And the main sentence I wish you to notice is this. The courts of the temple at Jerusalem, filled with the tumult of unholy traffic, represented something. It represented all too truly the temple of the heart defiled by the presence of sensual passion and unholy thoughts. Now do you see the point that that building had now changed from what it once was, a place of peace and quietness, to a place that was filled with a tumult of unholy traffic. Men and men fighting and bargaining over money values, over the price to be paid for this lamb or that or that kid of the goats or this whatever it might happen to be. And this change of noise and tumult and, and, and so forth is now a picture of what the people themselves had become. So if Israel had but looked at their temple and said, now that temple now shows us what we have come to and our need of a change and then come to God to have that change affected, then of course the temple would have changed back to being a picture again of what God desired that they should be. Now once we grasp the principle then that, and I'll just repeat it, God planned that the temple should be a picture of what the people themselves were to be. Its peace would be their peace. The gold inside be the, would be the gold inside their characters. The plainness of the outward adorning was illustrated by the plainness of the sanctuary's outward adorning as well. Now, when they turned aside and apostatized, then that building changed into a picture of what they had become. So, with that thought in mind, doesn't this give now a new perspective to the fact that stones from Rome had become a part of the structure of the Temple of Jerusalem? Now what business do stones from Rome have in the Temple of God? Absolutely no business whatsoever. For instance, when Sanballat and Tobiah in the restoration period desired to assist Nehemiah and Ezra in the, construction, in the reconstruction of the Temple and the buildings, what did, what did these men reply? We have nothing to do with you. You, you go build your own temple. We're not going to accept your service. And yet we find that in the days of Israel, the days of Christ and before, the Jews were glad to accept Roman wealth and Roman skill and Roman architecture to embellish and, and glorify and beautify their sacred temple. Now, in as much as the temple itself as a building symbolizes the body temple of each person in the church, and in as much as stones in a temple symbolize characteristics, then just as surely as Roman stones are found in the temple building, what do we expect to find in the characters and life of the Jews of that day? Roman principles, don't we? Roman principles. So let's check it out and see if we do find Roman principles in the temple of God of that time. First of all, is Rome a proud nation? Definitely. Right? Rome was very much a proud nation. In turn, we ask for the Jews are proud people at this time. And the answer is very definitely yes. Rome was a cruel nation. What were the Jews? What can you imagine more cruel than crucifixion, for instance, when they crucified Christ to death? And we might get in a long list of um, Rome was a persecuting power, so were the Jews. They persecuted Christ unmercifully and would have destroyed him if they could have done so. And if we were to examine the, uh, the religion of the Pharisees, we find that there was a system where men ruled over men in the place of God. Is that the Roman system? Absolutely. And so every principle of Rome was found reproduced in the temple of God and in the people of Israel at that time. So we have, we have then a very interesting situation existing in the days of Jesus Christ. Now, interestingly enough, the apostles pointed to these massive Roman stones and said, look at the way this building is constructed. How could that building fall? But, as, but just as surely as the Roman stones were indicative or representative of, of Roman principles in the hearts of the people, and just as surely as Roman principles in the hearts of, of, of the professed people of God guarantees their destruction, so that temple had no hope of survival, none whatsoever. And Christ could see with marvellous clarity what his disciples could not see. He could see that there would be not one stone left upon another. And we know the story, of course, that when the Romans under Titus broke into Jerusalem, and even though Titus had given express orders that the temple was not to be fired, it was fired. A soldier thrust a torch between the, between the hinges, 
the curtain blaze and in no time the massive cedar beams were, were, were burning and cedar can really burn and uh, this caused the gold lining on the ceiling and walls to melt and run down between the rocks or the great stones and the walls and when the whole thing cooled down the soldiers saw where the gold had gone they didn't rest they'd taken every single stone apart to get the gold out from between those stones and so literally every stone was taken apart stone by stone until nothing remained together in the entire building now let's come down to more modern times because we're drawing parallels to see if the same kind of situation didn't arise in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Because remember we're dealing with the Seventh-day Adventist Church from 1844 on. That was the Church of God. There's no question about that. It's not a question of what the Church um, was called to be. The question of course remains as to what she has become as was the question with the ancient Jewish Church as well. Now remember it says here that Herod the Great had lavished upon the Jewish temple both Roman wealth and Jewish treasure. Now, this is the most significant stone because who was Herod the Great? He was a wily Edomite. He was not a Roman and he wasn't a Jew. Now, who were the Edomites? They were the descendants of Esau, who was the son of Jacob, who was, who was the son of Isaac, and in turn, I beg your pardon, he was the brother of Jacob, not the son of Jacob, the brother of Jacob, the twin brother of Jacob who were both the sons of Isaac and the sons of Abraham. Now this means then that Herod the Great, because of his descent from Abraham, Isaac and, uh, Abraham and Isaac, had a common ancestry with the Jews. So he had, he had as you might say, one foot in their camp. He had a, he had a sympathetic uh, involvement with the Jewish nation. At the same time, he was a servant of Rome and he was a, a, a Roman, uh, he believed in, in the Roman doctrines and teachings. Now, what man better fitted than he to bridge the gap between Rome and the Jew? What better man? He, he had a foot in both camps, or an arm in both camps. The same as Jesus Christ, for instance, has one hand in heaven as a divine being and one down upon this earth as a human being and therefore forms a perfect ladder between earth and heaven. So, Herod the Great formed the bridge between Rome and the Jew. Now, in like manner, in the early part of the 1950s, two men from the evangelical churches, and evangelical churches are professedly Protestant, and therefore trace their origins back to the Great Reformation period, to which the Adventist Church likewise traces its origin. And yet, at the same time, Barnhouse and Martin, those evangelicals, were literally Roman Catholic in their belief. They strongly con contended that Jesus Christ came in sinless flesh and uh, therefore uh, they hold the same view in exactly as the Roman Catholic Church does in regard to the nature of Jesus Christ. And if you run down to their, their Sunday keepers as Rome is and so on and so on and so on. Now these men came to the Jews, I mean to the Adventists in the 1950s and they went to work on the temple of God and remodeled it. And uh, the book Question and Doctrine, of course, was the product of this remodeling. And when that book came out, it became very obvious that uh, some very significant changes had been made to Adventism. However, just as there were still two apartments in the earthly sanctuary back in Christ's day, and just as they still, occupied, they still sacrificed lambs and goats and uh, sheep and so forth, so it looked as if there had been no change in the ritual, Yet there had been great changes with all these embellishments and stones from Rome in the building. And so likewise, in the Adventist Church, great changes were made in the sanctuary message, although it appeared to many people without spiritual discernment that, that nothing had really changed at all, but it really had. Now, when those two men, Barnhouse and Martin, had finished their work in the Adventist Church, the sanctuary message had been remodeled. Just read the book Question and Doctrine, you'll find it out for sure. And that remodelling, of course, has gone on until today. There is a very marked apostasy from the original fundamental Adventist teachings. This means that today the theological stones from Rome are embedded in the Adventist theolog theological temple. And this means in turn, of course, that the principles of Rome are also embedded in, Ad in, in the Adventist church. And let's just check a few of them out to see if this is not true. For instance, the present Adventist hierarchical system of organization is an exact duplicate of the Roman system. It's a pyramid system. 
at the top of the Adventist church, for instance, stands the President, and who stands at the head of Rome? The Pope of Rome. Now, under the, next uh, to the um, Pope of Rome, of course, is the Curia, which is like the General Conference Committee. And then each the world is broken up into, into in the case of the Adventists, into divisions, and I'm not quite sure what the Catholics call there, but they also have the same kind of structure. What is it, diocese? Is, is, is that a great big national, national areas or just local areas? <coughs> Pardon? Some of them are larger than others. Yeah. And so it comes right down to you, to you reach the individual. And uh, all the way through there is the principal practice of man over man in the place of God. And there's no place whatsoever in either the Catholic system or the Adventist system for the Sabbath for its principles, which, which, which makes God to be the plan maker and Christ to be the true head of the church. That's non-existent. The Roman Catholic Church believes that Christ came in sinless flesh. What do the Adventists believe? Same thing. The Adventist Church practices in their medical institutions, drug therapy and so forth. If you go to a Catholic hospital, what, what difference do you expect to find in the treatment? None whatsoever. When it comes to amusement, to dress and all those things, you find it right down the line. All the great Roman Catholic principles are now very much embedded in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, including the use of force, subtle force sometimes, and persecution to gain their ends if possible. Now, true at the present time, we might not be able to quote any direct examples of persecution, but the church slumbers only because at the present time she's not being disturbed, particularly. But in the early days of this message, when we first um, were learning the message of Wagner and Jones and preaching that in, in, in the Seventh-day Adventist church, we certainly saw some very vigorous persecution going on. If any of you folk uh, really take this message in living power into some churches at least, you might find exceptions to this, but in some churches at least you will certainly generate some very bitter and energetic persecution. Now I contend that today, or back in the 50s anyway, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church we had a duplication of the situation in the church back in Christ's day. A perfect duplication, brought about by the same general procedures because Barnhouse and Martin being evangelicals or Protestants in their heritage or at the same time believe in Roman Catholic principles were the perfect bridge between Adventism and Rome. And it's significant, of course, that the Adventists have given a gold medal to the Pope and uh, have uh, spoken very highly of him, sat in his... Uh, Maxwell, for instance, talked of with great enthusiasm being seated just a few yards from the Pope at one time, which was an amazing declaration for him to make. Now then, the question arises... How will God deal with the present situation? What the present the situation we have today? And to find the answer we only have to go back and ask the question, how did God deal with the identical situation in the past? Because God's dealing with his people is or are ever the same. So when you find a situation today which duplicates a previous situation, then you can know what, what God will do today by what God did back there. And it's much easier to read the history of the past and see God's working back there and to predict what God will do in the future. But with this, with this kind of guide, we can't possibly go wrong. And the next study period, which is coming up in about 15 minutes' time, we will look into what God did back there and, what, and see that God is doing the same thing today. <coughs> now, it's five minutes to four. We stay a 20-minute break and at 15 minutes past we start. If you fuck on back, 